So it took me two weeks to get through the first chapter, and now I've got two weeks to get through the next three chapters. So I'm sure I can do it. <laughs> so Jonah, we picked up, started at the you know, beginning there a couple weeks ago, and where God, the word of the Lord, came to Jonah, a prophet of God, and told him that he needed to go to Nineveh. And Jonah famously told him no. Instead, he went to Tarshish. Well, he tried to go to Tarshish. He hopped on a boat to go to the other extreme, uh, the westernmost part of the known world at that point. And we talked about some of the reasons why Jonah may have done that. Now, we know that Jonah did, did it because ultimately he didn't think that the Ninevites deserved uh, the mercy of God. He didn't want them to be saved. Um, but politically, we talked about how Israel was gaining some strength and Assyria was losing some strength. Uh, and we knew, and he, you know, likely as a prophet of God and knowing the, the Bible and knowing, you know, everything that happened in the Israel, Israel's history at that point, that the Lord used these other countries surrounding them to, you know, to, to come knock Israel back into submission sometimes. And when Israel was doing what they weren't supposed to be doing, uh, the people, the countries around them were often used in, in getting them back in line. And then we also know that God was uh, Israel's God. You know, many of the Jews, especially even into the New Testament, didn't view, you know, God as somebody for the Gentiles. You know, God was their God. And so they had some issues with that. And then obviously, just the general fact that we, we've talked about that Nineveh uh, and Assyria in general was an evil, evil place. Uh, they, they did a lot of wicked stuff. They were rough in battle. You know, we talked about, you know, the entire cities, towns committing suicide prior to getting captured because they just would rather uh, die than, than be a part of whatever was going to happen to them. So... A lot of those reasons on, on why we believe that Jonah did, uh, made the decision that he did, but we also, you know, talked about how that we can't outrun God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today, uh, but in a kind of a different context. Uh, then we know the big storm came up, a miraculous storm, the, the shipmen there, the people on the ship, they knew it was, it was crazy, it wasn't a normal thing. Meanwhile, Jonah was napping peacefully uh, in the bottom of the ship. Not a care in the world, wasn't too worried about it. Uh, the captain comes down, wakes him up. Hey, why are you sleeping? Come on, we got, you know, this major storm going on up there. Pray to your God. You know, and you got this pagan man that, that, that worships a bunch of different gods telling the prophet of God to call upon the true God, the one that controls this storm. And Jonah knows, right? Uh, and, and so Jonah slept. The captain couldn't want him to tell why, so they cast lots. They figured out it's Jonah's fault. They tried with everything that they could do as humans. They threw all their wares overboard, threw all their supplies overboard, tried to make the ship lighter, get it on top of the water so maybe they wouldn't capsize, get, get torn up. They rowed as hard as they could, but nothing that they could do in their own human power could get them out of this storm that the Lord had led them into. And Jonah tells the story. He's like, yep, it's me. Throw me overboard. I'm at fault. I'm the reason why all this chaos and craziness is going on. And I'm not going to pray. Because I've pretty much already built this wall between me and God right now. <clears throat> I'm not going to do what I know I should do. I have this righteous anger that we had talked about. The anger where Jonah said, you know what? I'm right. I, I, I don't want to, you know. And he thought that in his own mind and in his own justification and his own spirit that what he was doing was justified. He thought that God wasn't doing what God should do. And in his anger, <clears throat> he was making some bad decisions, obviously. And then Jonah, we talked about Jonah's horrible testimony and the opportunity that he lost to glorify the Lord on that ship. The opportunity that he lost and just the horrible testimony that he was to these men. But yet, the Lord still got the glory out of it. So even though Jonah wasn't willing at that point to do what he knew he needed to do, God still used it. And those men saw the Lord and saw the power of the Lord and, and believed in him. And then they did as Jonah had instructed them to do. Tossed him overboard. And that is where we left off. So we will go ahead and we will read Jonah chapter number 2 now. And then we'll come back and talk about it a little bit. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. 
Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee and to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So here we have the prayer of Jonah while he is in the belly of the whale of the, of the great fish. And notice that it is a prayer of thanksgiving. This is a prayer that Jonah is praying to the Lord. Thankful he didn't die, right? He, he's happy that the Lord spared his life. He's happy uh, that he was delivered from what, what was going on. Um, not so much really a prayer of forgiveness, um, you know, he, he does, and we'll get into it as we get down to it, he does admit some fault in there and realize that what he's doing is not totally right, but not the kind of prayer, once again, that when we mess up, and we know we've messed up, that we come to the Lord with, and we ask him for his mercy. I mean, you know, you go through Psalm and, you know, David just over and over and over, you know, and, and one of the greatest things about David and why he was a man after God's own heart was that even when he messed up he wasn't afraid to go to the Lord and, and say look I know I messed up <laughs> confessing his sins repenting of his sins Jonah's not really repenting in, in here uh, he does he does like I said admit that he did do some things wrong but uh, this is a prayer of thanksgiving thankful that he's alive uh, and that he has not perished uh, the first thing I notice here about this passage in, Jonah, about, in this passage about Jonah's prayers was that he was inside the nasty smelly fish as this prayer was going up, which is an encouragement to all of us uh, because I don't think we're going to be able to top that one on the list of nastiest places you've prayed. So Jonah wins that contest, but by the fact that Jonah wins that contest, we can be assured <laughs> that no matter where we're praying, uh, that, that you're not going to top that. You know, I prayed in some tough spots. And a long time ago, Aaron, you know, fell off the little thing in, in, in um, Rock Cave um, out in Ohio, out east, the camping place. And that was a scary thing. I saw her fall. I didn't see her land. I didn't know how far she went. And I was praying all the way running down the hill, <laughs> you know. I, I got there, you know, in the ambulance. And then the scariest thing was when she got helicoptered out and I had to drive the two hours to Columbus and, you know, just not knowing what was going on. And that two hours was tough. Um, and, and, you know, we all have circumstances in our lives where something catastrophic has happened. Nobody's ended up in the belly of a fish. But bad stuff, and, and that's, you know, when we tend to think about praying, right? When the bad stuff's going on. And even in verse 1 here, we'll get down to it, that's... Jonah says, at the height of my infliction. But no matter what's going on in our life, no matter how bad we sin, no matter how bad our situation is, no matter what kind of chaos and craziness is going on in our life, the Lord's still there. He still hears your prayers. And He's still uh, there to help you through these things. So, Miss Ward came up to me the first week and she asked me a question and this is my question here. So Jonah was in this whale for three days and three nights. We covered that. And this passage indicates that at the end of his prayer, Jonah was regurgitated back up on the land. So what did he do for those other 71 hours and 58 minutes, you know, that he was in the belly of the whale? I mean, it's an interesting kind of thought there. 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously the Bible doesn't say. Was he out of it? You know, was he um, being grouchy still? And he have his arms crossed in the well, like, I'm not praying. I'm, you know, I don't know. Was he praying other stuff that, you know, he just didn't tell us about? Hard to say, but it is kind of, it is kind of an interesting thought there. Um, to, to think about <clears throat> what he was doing, I guess that's going to have to be part of the uh, Paul Harvey rest of the story once we get to heaven. <clears throat> but in this prayer, uh, there's also a lot of quotations from the book of Psalm. Obviously, Jonah, like we've talked about, was, was a prophet of God. He's well educated in the things of God. And <clears throat> there are all of these verses, like there's like seven or eight different parallels in the book of Psalm, and I didn't go through and write them all down because it had been a lot of back and forth. But if you want that information, I can get it to you. But we see that Jonah knew the word of God. And in his time of strife, in this struggle, knowing the word of God was beneficial to him, right? He was able to take the prayers uh, of the psalm writers and use them when he probably didn't really know what else to say, because Jonah's attitude up until this point wasn't great, so his own words probably wouldn't have been a good decision. So using the word of the Lord uh, to, to pray at this point is a, is a great tool. You know, the Awana program, I mean, we, they learn a lot of verses down there. Uh, Vacation Bible School, you know, we, we learn a lot of, and most of the verses, probably a lot of the verses that we as adults still know today, we probably learned up and you know till we were teenagers it's a lot harder when you get older to, to memorize verses uh, it's a lot easier when you're younger uh, and the older I get the more I realize that but it's an important thing uh, memorizing the word of God uh, let's turn over to Psalm 119 Psalm 119 11 is where we're going to read when I said Psalm 119 there's a lot of verses in Psalm 119 that pertain to the law, to the Word of God, to, um, you know, the, the statutes, commandments, the path. You know, they use a lot of different words. And it's an interesting study. And as I was kind of studying on, about this passage or about, you know, where, where we're going with this, I, I was looking at that. And there, Psalms 119, it's a really long book, obviously. But it's got a ton of stuff about the Bible. You should, you know, you really should look at it um, on your own time. It's a good, it would be a good study. But Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Having the word of God hid in your heart is one of the most important things uh, that we can do. It, for this situation in the verse there, it talks about so that you might not sin against God. Uh, in Jonah's case here, it was so you know the things to say to God when you're praying, you know, in the prayer of thanksgiving. And obviously there's a ton of different verses and lots of different subjects. Um, but learning the Bible, memorizing the Bible, committing those things, as Brother Love would say, to the tables of your heart. Um, I should have really done the accent, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> writing those things on the table of your heart, it's an important thing. And it's something that you will always have with you, and it's something that you can always use. So, important thing for us to do. And obviously, one of my favorite verses, 2 Timothy 3.16, also touches on the Scripture and how all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. And Jonah was a man that knew the Word of God, and it helped him in this prayer here. Now, in the first six verses of chapter number two, we kind of see here where Jonah is reaping what he sowed, right? And he has sown running from God. He's made bad decisions. And we kind of see in those first six verses him recounting the bad things that had happened to him and, and the reasons um, and, and what was going on with that and how he was reaping what he had sown, outlining his bad experience in the water and the belly of the fish. And then in verse seven, we see where Jonah remembers Jonah remembers in verse 7. Then verse 8, he comes to a realization. And then in verse 9 and 10, he recommits his life uh, to what, did he, what he knows he should be doing. Uh, so verse 1 there, we see Jonah prayed. Like we said, he hadn't prayed in a lot of opportunities 
leading up in the first, whole first chapter, he had a lot of big chances to pray. And he missed them. You know, when he, when he decided, well, should I hop a boat to Tarshish? He wasn't praying then. When he got on the boat, he wasn't praying. When he storm was coming, he wasn't praying. When the men were saying, hey, maybe your God can help. He wasn't praying. <laughs> when he was getting ready to get thrown overboard, still, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. But finally, he decides that he's going to pray. Um, no matter what's going on, no matter how long it took him, he did finally pray. So we are thankful for that. Let's read verse number two again. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Obviously, the first part of verse two here is very familiar to us. We all act this way at one point or another in our life. Uh, it takes great affliction for us to remember our need of our Savior. It takes something catastrophic happening before we're like, oh yeah, why don't I, why don't I pray about that? It takes something, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, um, when, we, when we realize that there's nothing else in our own power that we can do, that's when we decide that it's time to pray. We take for granted for the Lord when everything is going for right. You know, when the kids are healthy and when the bills are all getting paid and when everything's good and the car's running right. We take the Lord for granted. We just keep right on living our life and, and bebopping along. It takes something crazy like this. Uh, consistency is an important part of our Christian walk. Um, you know, we've talked about praying without ceasing before and having that attitude of prayer and how that, you know, consistency is an important thing when we're dealing with our relationship with the Lord. Let's read verses 3 through 6 real quick. For thou hast cast me into the deep and the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, corruption O Lord my God. So we see in these verses here, especially there at the beginning, where Jonah is acknowledging where this is coming from, right? He didn't say, ah, those stupid ship guys. Those, those idiot sailors threw me overboard because they couldn't take a little bit of storm. He realizes that this is from God. He says, thou hast cast me. Thy billows and thy, lost my place there, waves. And like Jonah, we know. A lot of times we know, right? Most of the time when something bad comes and it is a correction, we usually aren't too curious about it. We usually, it usually comes to mind really quick. And Jonah knew what he had done and, and why these things were, com were coming on him. And he wasn't trying to blame anybody else. He was taking that accountability. He knew that he had messed up. <clears throat> Hopefully, we won't have to wait three days and three nights like he did. But Jonah acknowledges this from God. He knows he's in trouble. And I think this is where Jonah finally realized that his righteous anger really wasn't doing him any favors. Now, I still kind of think he thinks he's right. <laughs> but his righteous anger at this point, he's like, okay, I just got to let go of this. And hopefully we all come to that point when we're dealing with something in our lives where we realize, I just got to let go of this. I know, I know I'm right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure... That, you know, that other person's making a bad decision, but I need to let go of this. And Jonah finally let go, and in verse 7, we see that he remembers. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. So he remembered. He had built that wall that didn't allow him to pray for a long time when those pagans were, even when the pagans were asking him to. But here he remembers God when his soul's fainted. You know, they say there's no atheists in foxholes or in giant fish. That's, once again, he remembers. Jonah knows God's there and his prayers will be heard. 
And like we've talked about, that is, that is great to know. Um, notice the contrast too here from the first line in verse 6 where he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. And then down in the last line in verse 7, it, the, my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. So here we have the total opposite, <laughs> speaking worldly and earthly again, in the depths of the ocean all the way up to heaven. And once again... It's an assurance to us and how that our prayers are heard. He was in the depths of the sea, totally compassed about by waves and billows and seaweed wrapped around his head. What a sight it must have been. His prayer going up to heaven, all the way up to heaven, and it got through. Verse 8, Jonah realized, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So Jonah is admitting some fault here, right? He is saying, okay, I know I've done wrong. As long as I'm making my own way, as long as I have this sinful pride, as long as I observe my lying vanities, as long as I entertain my empty lies, as long as I go ahead and I justify my ignorance, you know, he, he's kind of saying, okay, I'm really giving up on the mercies of, of the Lord. I'm really, I'm really... I'm not, now, I think, too, that this was kind of uh, maybe a, a, hey, think this about Nineveh, too. They worship their lying vanities as well. Now, I don't, I don't know, you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to look too far into it. And you don't want to, because I do believe that Jonah is sincere in this prayer. I mean, I, I listen, like I said, I've, I've listened and studied a lot of different people and their take on this. And a lot of people have an issue with this prayer in fact, one of the, the book that I taught in out of Sunday school, the writer really kind of was pretty rough on Jonah and said that, you know, this whole prayer was kind of, you know, half and half. I don't believe that's true. I believe that Jonah truly knew what he had done was wrong as far as ignoring his call from God. Now, I'm still not totally sold on whether he believes he should be going to Nineveh, and we see later that he kind of reinforces that but we all have ups and downs in our lives right and within a day or two we can totally change our minds so I do believe that Jonah's prayer was sincere here and I really believe that he saw that his um, pride that his entertaining his empty vanities you know his, or his lies his, his empty lies um, was was a bad thing and in James 4 17 it says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him and to sin Jonah knew what he should have been doing, and he was doing it not, <laughs> so to him it was sin. And I think he realized that. Anytime we replace the Lord and his direction into anything, it's a false God, right? And that's kind of, <clears throat> that's what Jonah's acknowledging here. I put my own desires, my own vanities, my own empty lies, I put that in the place of, of you. I, sh I shouldn't have done that. I'm, I was forsaking the mercy of God by doing that. I shouldn't have replaced you. And I really do believe that this is a sincere prayer here that Jonah had on his heart. He realized he was wrong. And then in verse 9, he recommits. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the vows of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Jo Jonah recommits to the vow that he had vowed. As a prophet of God, Jonah knew that he must follow his commands. And vows are very important things, right? These are not things to be taken lightly, especially when you make them with God. Now, I'm sure, once again, we've all <laughs> had issues with that in our lives where we've tried to make a deal with God. Well, if you will just, then I will. And we've all probably made promises to God that we haven't followed through with. <clears throat> and we have to be careful about that. The Lord is merciful, merciful, merciful. <laughs> the Lord is merciful, but he does, he does have a line too. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 23 real quick. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. <clears throat> when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God... Thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, 
and it would be sin in thee. So the Lord's clear. You make a vow, you should keep it. When you make a vow unto the Lord, you should keep it. And Jonah realized this. He's like, okay, I'm a prophet. I'm given a message. I'm supposed to give it to the people that, that I'm told to. Um, and, I, and I will do that. In the last part of 9 there, Jonah says that salvation is of the Lord is of the Lord. Basically, salvation belongs to the Lord, is what he's saying there. Now, deep down, he's thinking, well, maybe the Ninevites will still, God, will still die, but if they do, that's God's decision. Salvation is of God, not of Jonah. Jonah can't make that decision on whether these people deserve to be saved, whether these people deserve the mercy of God. That's not Jonah, and that's not us. We talked about that in the first week. We all know people or have seen people or are aware of people that we don't believe deserve God's mercy. I'm sure we've all said it. You know, we've seen the news on TV and, or the new, a story on TV and we'll go, well, those, that guy definitely deserves to die. And humanly speaking, you know, I definitely have probably said it myself. But it's not our call, right? The Lord uh, will, will take care of these things. And we kind of see finally here that Jonah is getting some, some peace about, about what he's saying. Now, when he's saying this, he doesn't know for sure that he's getting spit out still, right? He's in the belly of the fish. He's probably still a little concerned, but he has some peace about this. And, and you know, the message Sunday morning um, Brother Phil there in the, at the end when he was talking about rest. And I really like this quote, so I went back on YouTube today just to get it to make sure I got it right. Rest doesn't come from ideal circumstances, but trusting God in every circumstance. Rest doesn't come from ideal circumstances. That's what we're looking for in life, right? The perfect circumstances. The ideal circumstances. In our, that's what we want. We want everything just to be smooth. But rest doesn't come from ideal circumstances. Because we've all been in smooth running where, you know, it's still not great. Like, we're, you know, there's still that emptiness. That we still might have that thing inside of us where we're, even though things are going right, we know we're not necessarily doing everything we need to do. Rest comes from knowing, from trusting God in every circumstance. And here Jonah is starting to, to see that. And he's, he's okay with what's going on. He's realizing what I did was wrong. Salvation is of the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. And then verse 10, probably one of the grossest verses in the Bible. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. <clears throat> so uh, now Jonah is back on the right track, and he has another opportunity. Let's go ahead and read chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And the war word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So now we see here in this verse that our, our obstinate will doesn't change God's omniscient will. Right? I stole that. Totally stole that quote from somebody. But go ahead and write that down. <laughs> Our obstinate will, the will that we just, doesn't matter, we're not going to do what we want to do, will not outweigh God's omniscient will. He knows it all. He knows what needs to happen, and he knows if he's going to make it happen. There are times where God lets us do our own thing. There are times where God doesn't, you know, always smack us back in the line right away. Uh, but when God knows what needs to happen, He's going to accomplish His will because He's omniscient. He knows uh, everything. He is all-knowing. Even when we have no understanding about God's plan, His plan is perfect and it will get done. We also see that God here is a God of second chances, which once again, uh, we should all be thankful for because we're on at least number two. At least. At least number two. God wasn't just interested in Nineveh, right? He was interested in Nineveh. 
And he makes that abundantly clear. But he wasn't interested just in Nineveh. He was interested in Jonah too. The, the prophet that was a little off track, that had his righteous anger, that was telling God, God, you're wrong. God still cared about him. God still saw a man and all of his flaws that could still accomplish the work of the Lord. He knew that despite the fact that Jonah was a knucklehead and didn't listen very well, that he could still get done what needed to get done. That he would still be able to do what the Lord had, had wanted him to do. God still wanted to use him. <clears throat> now, not only did God forgive Jonah, but just like all of us, he forgets. He cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. And what a great thing that is for us, because once again, we're all on at least number two. <clears throat> Jonah gets the same command as he did way back when he was in Gath Heifer, several days, weeks ago, to arise, go to Nineveh, and preach the message uh, that I am going to, that I'm going to give you. Not only does he have the same command, but he also has the same message. Destruction, right? Not good for Nineveh. Uh, but a destruction, a message of destruction. Now we are going to see that Jonah does what he's told this time, but we also need to be careful about testing God's mercy. Let's turn over to Proverbs twenty nine eleven or twenty nine one. Proverbs twenty nine one. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So, <laughs> Jonah does what he's supposed to do here, but once again, we need to be careful about our stiff neckedness, you know, about our unwillingness to listen to the omniscient will of the Lord. We need to be careful that we are not um, ignoring the Lord's call. Because he is merciful, he is long-suffering, he does give us lots of chances. But at some point, he might have to get you chucked into the Mediterranean Sea. So we need to be careful about that. Back to Jonah, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. So this was a great journey away. Doesn't say exactly where he was thrown back up on the land figuring it was somewhere about where he got off. So he had several hundred miles to go. Uh, by some estimations, you know, it took him, you know, close to a month to go ahead to get from, you know, he might have went faster because he was pretty, <laughs> he's pretty motivated at this point. Because um, I imagine this whole trip, he's thinking, you know, no matter what happens to me on my way to Nineveh or in Nineveh, at least I'm not in a giant fish belly. So, he was probably motivated, but, but at any rate, it was, a, it was a pretty good distance for him to go to a place that he had never been before. So um, it, it likely took him a while to get there. And then once he got there, it says that the city was three days' journey across. So it was going to take him about three days to travel around the city uh, giving the message of the Lord. My page is sticking together. All right, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. We see here in this verse that God's word is for everyone. Like we talked about before, not just the people we like, not just the moral people that we believe deserve it, but everyone. And we also see that the message that the Lord gives is an urgent message. It's not something that uh, we should waste our time or waste time accomplishing. You know, you think about all of the time that it took Jonah to run from his house to the to the water. However long he was out on the ship, the Bible doesn't say, but forever that however long that period of time was, and then the period of time it took him back to get all the way to Nineveh, and all that time expired, and there were people in Nineveh that died, undoubtedly, right? I mean, there are. There were things that happened. Once again, missed opportunities. Jonah um, wasted time he shouldn't have wasted. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. 
Romans chapter 13, read verses 11 and 12. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Very clear here. And it's only getting further, right? It was it's been a long time since this book was since this book was written. And it was important and urgent then. How much more important and urgent is it for us today? We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what's going on. Now we do uh, thankfully know who holds tomorrow, as the saying goes. Uh, but we, we shouldn't be wasting our time. And then uh, a little bit here about preaching. Preaching the Word of God changes lives. And we, we see that throughout the Bible. Throughout the Word of God, men preaching the Word of God to people changes lives. And we see here that these eight little words that Jonah gave to the Ninevites, we haven't seen that it changed their lives, but it does, spoiler alert for next week, it changes their lives a lot. These eight little words, the smallest prophecy that you're going to probably find in the Bible, pretty sure it's the smallest one you're going to find, and it changed an entire city. I mean, that should be encouraging for us too, right? Because we see, you know, he didn't have any slideshows. He didn't have any object lessons. He wasn't eloquent. He didn't even tell them anything that made them feel good. He didn't say, well, here, but fellas, listen, there's an opportunity. (laughs) Here's what you could do. No, he says, 40 days, you're all going to die. Now, I've heard people say that they think maybe he said more. I don't think he did. I think that was his message. And I think that that was the message that God wanted him to give. And I think God needed a grumpy guy <laughs> that was to give this message. And I think that's why Jonah was chosen, for this message specifically. Because God knew that Jonah would do it, and he would do it the way it needed to be done. We all have different gifts. We talked about that, Brother Phil talked about that Sunday night. We all have different spiritual gifts. We all have different callings. We all have different things that the Lord wants us to accomplish. Jonah had his thing and he did it. Looking back on it, we can be, you know, is, is, uh, is, you know, look down on him as much as we want. But he accomplished what the Lord wanted and the greatest revival probably ever occurred because of those eight little words. We all have a message. Now, we all know some of our messages, the Great Commission to go preach, teach, you know, tell people how to be saved, create disciples that can tell other people how to be saved. But we have other messages that the Lord gives to us on any given day. You know, a little pushing in your heart to, eh, you should probably talk to that person. You know, looks like they're having a rough day. Maybe just saying hi... We all have things in our lives that the Lord wants us to accomplish. And we are picked for a reason. Um, God has a message for us to share. And only we can share it the way that it needs to be shared. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need any uh, eloquence. You just need what the Lord gives you. Alright, we'll pick up next week and we'll see... Specifically, we already know that good things happen, but specifically what happens. All right, let's dismiss. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time that you've given to us, that we could come to your house, that we could open your word, and we could see uh, the example uh, of Jonah specifically, Lord, and the willingness that Jonah had to give this message uh, despite him really not wanting to do it, Lord. Just pray that even when we feel uncomfortable with what you give for us, that we will still have the courage uh, to, to give that message to the people that we need to give it to. Lord, just pray that you'd be with us, keep us safe, bring us back on Sunday. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.